Welcome, fellow songwriters, uh, to episode 11 in my series, A Songwriter's Notes on Songwriting. This is the penultimate episode. It'll be just one more to kind of wrap things up uh, in a week or two. Uh, my name's Dan Colbert, and uh, I'll be grateful for uh, your comments to this and any others in the uh, series. Uh, and uh, for my songs, I hope you'll listen to my songs, which are in the links below and on my channel, which again, I hope you'll uh, subscribe to. Thanks for that. Uh, today, I want to talk uh, more broadly about song arrangement, of which structure, which I talked about last uh, uh, time, is an important part of arrangement. But we'll set that aside again since I covered that last time along with bridges. Uh, and we'll talk about other elements of um, song arrangement today. So aside from structure, what do I mean by uh, when I use the word arrangement uh, for songs? It includes things like dynamics, that is volume variations, instrumentation, tempo, instrumental voicings, vocal harmony, and um, a number of other things that uh, uh, I won't be covering. Uh, these are the most important elements. I'll talk about each of these separately, but first I want to take a minute to kind of motivate why you should even care about these and thinking about these and incorporating some of these concepts into your songwriting. Um, uh, throughout the series, I've kind of beat a drum about taking care in your songwriting to find ways to keep the sound of your song fresh. Uh, not to, as I've said, kind of tire the listener's ear. Okay, repetition is a really important part of a good song. Remember the discussion on chanting? Um, uh, and, you know, to me, a, a chorus, which is you know, the same lyric repeated to the same melody, for the most part, um, is, is uh, largely about repetition, about kind of planting that earworm, right? But you don't want anything to get stale, okay? So these, are, these elements of arrangement, as I've kind of categorized them in, are important ways to help with that. Um, in my opinion, there's no single more Im impactful way to do this than with dynamics. You'll create interest in the ear, uh, you'll create drama if you want, if you're going for that, and all sorts of emotional effects by varying the dynamics of your song, okay? I've talked about the playing in process, you know, once you're kind of 90% done with the basic elements of your song, uh, and you're, you're playing it in to really soak it into your bones and to work out small little uh, nuances. Uh, one thing you should, in my opinion, always work on during that play-in period is dynamics. And I uh, urge you not to be casual about it. Work with it. Be deliberate. Okay, Experiment with it. Way too many times have I heard songs played at kind of a single volume throughout, myself included. It's natural, okay? Uh, and, and, and it's also natural, and I do this a lot, to end with kind of a big finish to your song, uh, depending on what your style is. There's nothing wrong with that. But more subtle changes in volume before that end section uh, can really enhance your song and they also set off any uh, changes in um, uh, quieter passages will set off changes in louder passages that you might want to go for. Uh, one way to work with uh, dynamics is to relate the volume and the overall feel to what the lyrics are conveying at, uh, at that moment in the song. Uh, I don't think there's any point in my uh, belaboring that point or even giving you examples. I think you all know what, uh, what I mean by that. 
and it's a fairly natural thing to do. But what I'm urging you to do is to be mindful of that, to really um, you know, put that on your list of things to pay attention to, particularly during that play-in pro process where you're going to kind of cement in a lot of these things. Not that you can't have variations. Of course you can when you play out or, or what have you. Uh, if you're doing a recording, of course, that's a, uh, you know, you really do want to be very thoughtful and deliberate about what you're doing. So, but playing out gives you an opportunity to experiment uh, further with things like dynamics. But still, you just want to be mindful and thoughtful about these things. Tempo is another element that will affect the overall feel of your song a lot and which you can experiment also uh, with during the play-in period. I have a song, um, Genie Oblige, which I wrote in honor of one of my heroes, Franz Liszt. Um, and when I wrote that, it was about 60 beats per minute, something like that. Uh, and it, it went like this, if I can remember it. that line and I, I hear an out of tune string so but you get the idea um, and when I brought that into a band setting we played it through a couple times and then the drummer said hey do you mind if we try that uh, faster and I said sure so we did and here's how it went just a lot better, at least in the band setting. Now, it doesn't mean that it can't be played um, slower. Um, in fact, um, uh, Joni Mitchell uh, recorded um, about 20 years ago, I think she re-recorded uh, her uh, song, Both Sides Now, which was not an especially fast song, but you know, it's probably about 74 beats a minute. And she slowed it down dramatically, probably below 60. Um, in fact, I'm sure it's in the 50s. And uh, it's an extremely effective song at that tempo, at both tempos, but it just, it almost makes it a different song. So experiment with that and see what might work best for different circumstances, different contexts, different environments, whether you're solo or with a band. You can almost get two different songs out of it, out of working the tempo. Some songs will really want to be at a certain tempo, so don't try to force it. But it's something that really can be uh, uh, lovely to find that your song might work at a different uh, tempo than you had intended when you first wrote it. So I encourage you to experiment with that. In special cases, you may want some rhythmic variation in the song itself, but here's one that I suggest you really be careful with. Uh, rhythm is one of the first things that kind of gets settled into a song, and it, it, it really defines as much as anything the character of your, your song. So for me, a change of rhythm um, tends to be more associated with a, a more specific kind of rhythmic change, a change in meter. For example, where I may shift, um, uh, well, in my song, uh, Rain Shade, I, this, the bulk of the song is in 4-4 four, four time, common time, but I shift the bridge into a little bit slower uh, six eight meter, and it it uh, and you can find a link to that uh, song in the pinned comment below. But it really changes uh, the whole feel of that bridge, which is what I intended, and the lyrics kind of go along with that and the melody. So um, you know, so that's kind of 
taking a chunk and changing the meter. Uh, staying in the same meter and changing the rhythm, uh, I'm sure I can find some examples and you can find examples that have worked really well, so I'm not telling you or suggesting not to do it. Uh, there's nothing illegal in songwriting or out of bounds. Um, uh, it's, it's, I'm just saying it's something that I think you have to be a lot more careful with. And, um, uh, I might even say will not work that often, um, for you. But, uh, but hey, try it out. Um, changing the meter or, or rhythm, um, uh, is, is an effective way of, of shifting the feel as long as you can hear, uh, and as you can hear in, in Rain Shade, for example, is, is really tied into what's being expressed in the lyric. Le and I'm going to actually, uh, contradict myself a little bit and say, one of my favorite things to do in a band setting in particular is to kind of do some, what I think of as uh, rhythmic surfing, particularly during an instrumental section, like when the lead guitarist is soloing. And as a rhythm guitarist, I love to, uh, to shift, uh, even in the same meter, in the same time signature, to shift the rhythm. Maybe, uh, you know, where we're doing some straight beat, I'll shift to doing some syncopated beat or even swing, uh, light swing, heavier swing. I personally, uh, I kind of get off on, on that kind of rhythm surfing and the band has fun with that. It's a great thing to do in that kind of environment. That's more in the environment of what I call a kind of jam um, within a song. Uh, and, uh, the scope of this, uh, series has been more on, you know, kind of the, the three to six minutes of your kind of set song that you might put on an album, for example, or play as a solo artist live. Um, although of course the, uh, the rhythm surfing, uh, live is a lot of fun too. I tend not to do that that much. Uh, maybe I should more, it would be fun. Uh, it really works well with a, in, a, in a band setting because as a solo artist, it's a little harder to bring out the rhythm in, in as forceful a way as when you have uh, a real rhythm section, drums and, and bass uh, behind you. Um, okay. Uh, sometimes in some of my songs, I'll put in an instrumental section. This is more of a structure item and we talked about structure last time. But you might want to uh, consider including an instrumental section. In other words, a, a section where you don't sing. Uh, I don't recall ever doing this myself with a chorus. Um, maybe I have. But I do sometimes include an instrumental verse. Uh, for instance, uh, Too Many Miles, Peace of Mind, or Songs of Mine, uh, where I do that. Uh, pretty often, more often, I'll include an instrumental bridge. Uh, more Ways, Fear and Greed, Make It Yours are some examples of my songs. Again, links in the pinned comment below. It's just a nice way, or can be a nice way, of breaking things up. Which again goes back to uh, not tiring the ear out and just uh, switching things up a little bit. Okay. Now I mentioned at the top in the list of uh, kind of arrangement items, I mentioned voicings. What do I mean by that? It has nothing to do with singing. This is an instrumental thing purely. On both guitar and piano, and I'm assuming most of you um, play either guitar and or piano, uh, there are dozens of ways to play any given chord. For example, you can play on the keyboard, you can play uh, uh, any given chord low or high just by sh shifting your hand and keeping the fingering the same. You can do that on the guitar fretboard as well. Even more interesting though to me is things like inversions, 
What's an inversion? Well, way back when we talked about harmony, we talked about a, a chord as a, typically a triad of notes. So you have the tonic note, which the chord is named for, say it's a G major chord. So that, that would be G in the bass, the lowest note in the chord being the G, the tonic chord, okay? And, um, and then the uh, major third above uh, that would be a B, okay? And then the D as the perfect fifth above that, that's a G major chord. And the kind of the, 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 uh, uh, the un- inverted chord would be in that order, G, B, D, okay? If you have, the first inversion would be with the B in the bass, and the second inversion, as it's called in theory, would be with the D in the bass, okay? And those all give different sounds. So here's, here's a, an uninverted G major. And here's, here's a, a second inversion. I'll tell you what that means in a minute. Sounds really different. So the first one is, you can hear that, right? The second one is the D, the perfect fifth is actually in the bass. Okay, gives you a really different sound, okay? It's just a different sound. It's also a different sound because on the guitar, because of where it's being played on the instrument, okay? You're, you're strumming or picking uh, strings at a higher place or a different place on the fretboard. Another way to do this kind of thing, not inversions, but just differences in chords, variations in chords, um, many guitar players will play, you can't see the guitar in the video, I'm sorry about that, will play a, uh, an A2 or an A9, A add 2, we talked about this at the beginning, um, way on, down on the second fret. Okay, here's A major, and here's A2. Okay, it's just with a B added in. Okay. But you can also play it on the sixth and seventh frets. It's the same essentially the same chord. Sounds really different. Actually, the one down here, the first one I played, is missing the third. It's missing the C-sharp, which this one has. So, sometimes chords will be missing uh, uh, the third or the fifth. Um, on guitar, it's very interesting, and of course piano can do this too, on guitar, since you have six strings, and sometimes we play five or six of the strings when we strum, um, some of the notes, say it's a, just a simple major chord, triad, okay? Some of the notes can be doubled or even tripled, okay? Some of them, as I just showed you with the A2, can be missing. So you have all kinds of variations, even if it's the same chord, okay? different positions on the instrument, different, you know, string tensions, all that kind of thing. They really make different sounds, okay? So, allow your, now this goes back really to the harmony section, but to me, you know, you can, you can arrange a song, so I don't do this very much, but I'm sure I have a couple examples where I do have something, like, um, First Day of Spring, I play, um, it's basically just uh, A and um, uh, A and uh, D6, okay? And I start out up in the middle of the fretboard. same chords essentially but uh, but in a different place on the fretboard and it gives you a different sound 
So you can think about, you know, doing it one way during one verse or chorus and another way uh, during another verse or chorus. It's a nice uh, way to freshen sound at different, different places. Okay. Um, staying with kind of the voicing idea or changing up the chords, different voicings of the same chord can sound like different chords, so they make, again, a big impact on the overall sound of your song. One of my favorite things to do, which is also done a lot by Tracy Chapman and Dave Matthews, for example, is to leave out the perfect fifth of the chord, okay? Only work with the tonic and the third, whether it's a major or minor third. Um, so, for example, um, uh, that's a G major chord, but without the fifth, okay? Here's an A. Okay, uh, A minor. Okay. Actually, these have the fourth in it, so I could either mute that or have it. Uh, and so on, B minor. I use that a lot. In fact, I wrote a whole song uh, kind of using this, several songs by now. Uh, one is called uh, Refuge, and it just goes like this. last two chords were just first position E minor and A major, but the rest of it was using those um, uh, dyads the, the miss, uh, that are missing the, uh, the fifth of the chord. So, uh, so it gives you, again, a different sound. And this really all goes back to the other drum that I beat throughout this uh, series which is fool around on your instrument, experiment, try things, make mistakes. I've had some uh, whole songs really come out of putting my fingers down on strings that I didn't mean to put them down on and play a different chord than I meant to, okay? Uh, pay attention to those kinds of mistakes. They can really lead you somewhere because they're, in a sense, there's no mistake on these instruments. They're all sounds that you're making, and you get to decide what sounds good, what it can work with, uh, what you can do with it, and that's one of the great joys of uh, creating music, okay? Okay, moving on. Instrumentation is another really important element of arrangement. Now, as a solo artist, probably playing piano or guitar, singers, songwriters. It's just uh, our one instrument and our voice, right? But if you bring it to a band setting, or if you want to record, record your song, um, uh, for instance, I, I'm doing a recording project where I'm playing bass and, uh, you know, I have... Uh, rhythm, uh, built-in rhythm in devices that I can uh, program, things like that. Uh, I have a keyboard that I can add. So I, you know, I think, I think about these things, right? Um, do drums even belong on your track? How about a bass? Lead guitar, horns? Uh, do you feature any of them? Uh, how, do, how do they fit with the dynamics? Uh, so these considerations and, and more are, it can get to be kind of complex. Getting deeply into such things um, was really a big part, in my opinion, of the success of groups like the Beatles and the Beach Boys, for example, where George Martin and uh, Brian Wilson, respectively, really worked hard at instrumentation, really hard. And they used exotic things. They used French horns and uh, all, well, even much crazier things than that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's beyond the scope of this series to really go into details about all that. 
partly because, frankly, I don't have a lot of experience myself doing this. Mostly in a band setting, I let my bandmates figure out their parts. Uh, but if you're motivated, uh, it can be a great part of your arrangement. I recently recorded um, a song of mine, American Karma. Maybe I'll stick it in the uh, comment. Uh, where I did all the parts myself and uh, kind of I have an outro in it which uh, either needs a lead guitar or some kind of feature instrument and I have a keyboard with different voicings and uh, uh, I got a voicing that sounds kind of like a horn and uh, you know I did it there and I think it worked out pretty well um, so, you know, and the last thing I'll say about this is, uh, instrumentation is, if you are working with a producer, any good producer should really have a lot of ideas about uh, arrangement overall, but particularly about instrumentation. Uh, a famous, there are lots of famous examples, but one that I always remember is when Simon and Garfunkel first recorded The Sounds of Silence, it was kind of a singer-songwriter thing. There were two voices and a guitar. And it did not do anything really in the charts. They went to England and um, it was not doing anything. And their producer, Ray Halley, decided to put horns on it, okay, and, and, and drums. I don't, I don't think the, if the original one had drums, it was very light. And so it was a much heavier sound. And uh, I think it went to number one then, that version. Okay, so that's, that's how much arrangements, instrumentation in particular, can affect a song. Okay, last item. Um, vocal harmony. Uh, this may be what most people first think of when we talk about uh, song arrangements. Okay. Uh, but as I've just talked about, it's certainly not the only thing. Uh, where to include uh, the harmonies in your song, okay? You don't want to overdo it. I tend to kind of not do them, you know, in the first part of the song and then maybe start including them maybe in a later chorus or the last chorus only. Uh, every chorus or just some, what harmony parts, two or three, how much are they in the background or foreground? Uh, as you know from listening to such groups as the Eagles or Crosby, Stills and Nash, um, many others, vocal harmony can be a huge lift for a song if done tastefully. It's what a lot of people most love about these groups that I just mentioned and again many others. Again, I can't get into the details except to say that working out the harmonies with other singers can be a lot of work, okay? It's worth it, but there's a lot of nitty-gritty to, to work out. Now, some people do have a natural ability to just drop in with great harmonies, but if, especially if you're thinking about recording a song, you want to be pretty deliberate about, about that kind of thing. Um, so you really kind of have to work it out, practice it. Uh, also, for those of you who are singer-songwriters um, out there, there are devices out there, I use them both in my solo and band settings, that will layer on harmonies for you automatically. They're called harmonizers. Boss makes uh, at least two, which I have. Um, the VE2 and VE8. I think they make a couple more also, but you might want to look those up by Boss, VE2 and VE8. They're great, they have certain effects on them, but the key thing is you, you press a pedal, you have a setting and you press a pedal and magically uh, harmonies appear, okay? And they're pretty good usually. Um, again, my advice really is to use these judiciously, you can definitely overdo it in harmony, whether with a device or with actual people, okay? Enjoy what you're doing, and uh, I'll wrap up next time, and until then, stay in tune.